One of our guests, Mark Furnish, is a criminal and civil litigator. Doug Burns, also a former federal prosecutor, who we have on the program quite often. Good to see both of you gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Mark, could you in just a few seconds talk a little bit about that Bank of China problem? Yeah, I've been involved in major federal criminal and civil prosecutions in the Bank of China, involving the Bank of China. It's long been run as a racketeering enterprise and it's a notorious international sponsor of terrorism and it should be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law. Terrorists can't commit their heinous acts without financial support and international uh, laundering of funds and they need to be uh, brought to bay for that. You know what we learned from Leland Vitter's report though is that they have put some things in place. I don't know if there'll be real regulations that we could point to but maybe even on the sort of subliminal level if you will that they want to protect themselves legally because if money is used that they've helped kind of move around to kill U.S. citizens, that would become problematic for them. Well, it's problematic and they should implement uh, better controls over it rather than tacitly looking the other way uh, with money that ultimately goes into the hands of the Iranians to jeopardize the safety and health and welfare of innocent people. Very interesting. All right, let, let's talk about the Supreme Court health care arguments that are going forward and, and really where we stand. Uh, Doug, can you just kind of catch us up sure. with where we are right it, now? It's really interesting because uh, the Supreme Court has allotted six hours of oral argument between March 26th and March 28th. Is that a lot of time? Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> Tremendous. It's uh, sort of Mark could weigh in with this un unprecedented, unusual, et cetera. And basically, you have a big case that came out of Florida, the Fourth Circuit. Um, and the way you have to break this down is the sort of soundbite issue that everybody is talking about legitimately, which is this, you know, mandatory you have to purchase insurance issue. But then there's a lot of other very complicated legal issues in the case. I'll just give you it real quick. One is what we call severability. In other words, can you take just the mandatory part, carve that out, say that's no good, and leave mm -hmm. the rest in place? or throw out the entire law, that's one issue. And then lastly um, is the issue that the mandatory provision, part of it, or maybe all of it, doesn't kick in until 2015. Okay. So we have what's called ripeness, meaning you can't bring a lawsuit now until it kicks in. So ripeness? those are some of the ripeness. Yeah. That's very <laughs> Believe it or not, no, that's a legal You mean term. that the fruit of health care for this president <laughs> has not quite ripened yet. A case is not considered ripe. It's funny that you know I never got somebody's sort of visceral reaction to that legal term, but ripeness is a well established term and it's comical, you're right. That's why they don't let journalists into the courtroom. Because <laughs> we, we get excited about words like ripe. That's funny. Uh, severability on the mandate issue. That would sound yeah. like, um, and I don't want to move too political too quickly, but right. we've got Mark Hanna on set here who worked with the John Kerry uh, presidential campaign. I'm curious, this president, how, how might he look at that? Do you think that would be something that, that even might be okay with Mr. Obama? At least he wouldn't lose health care. Yeah, I mean, I think it would have to be up to his, uh, you know, his legal team. He would get advice from them. But I, I think that you know, ensuring uh, every American is paramount for this president. Um, there's precedent for it, uh, you know, precedent in Massachusetts for it. Uh, even the, even the. Yeah, the, I've heard about that. You might have, you might have on the, some of this coverage coming out of this. Uh, there's some some sort of a uh, some sort of campaign going on right now. Uh, right. On the, <laughs> so Mitt Romney, no, Mitt, what it was a core part of uh, a cr critical part of Mitt Romney's uh, plan in Massachusetts, and there's there's a uh, it has never been a challenge to my mind, especially right. at the right. Supreme Court level. Right, right. Um, so the fact that this is coming about now seems slightly maybe politically motivated, <laughs> um, but I do think that it's, uh, the mandate issue is going to be, it's going to be interesting to watch. All right, let's talk with another legal mind here on set, Mark Furnish, about uh, if you, you could talk about the severability on the mandate issue or something greater that you see going well, on. Well, here. I actually am a little surprised that they waded into the political fray, especially in an election year. And I expect the case ultimately to be decided more on political than legal grounds. And it reminds me of Bush versus Gore redux. And, and the court runs the risk of further compromising its institutional integrity because it took a lot of flack after the Bush versus Gore case. And I don't think it's ever really recovered from that. So whatever it does, uh, it's wading into uh, tough waters here with this case. Uh, legally, what can we expect to see? I mean, you talk about six hours. I <laughs> asked the question. Is that a long time before the Supreme Court? Fifteen minutes in front of the Supreme Court is a long time. <laughs> well, you you get gotta an have hour. your act together. So you can't see lawyers going in there and doing like a well, you know, Bob, I think it would be a really I mean, what are we gonna see? <laughs> I, I think that you're gonna get a, a ruling that is going to not have that much precedential impact. Ultimately nobody remembers what the holding in Bush versus Gore was. It's going to be a result driven decision, uh, lacking far reaching implications. And that's what I think we'll ultimately see from the case. 
That sounds like code for a waste of time. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm not you're a legal here. mind. I'm just the mom. I'll tell you what. You may be right. <laughs> yeah. Because the point is, working off of uh, Mark, I'm happy to go into the, the uh, political part of this. Um, you know, Bush v. Gore, what, what a great point. Nobody remembers what that case meant other than that it decided the election. So here, I'm not going to go so far as to say this will per se decide the election, but by the same token, if Obamacare is upheld, that's a huge political point. I, I don't think that the populace at large understands health care. I, I think the legal issues are yeah. so abstract that nobody will be able to grasp them. And ultimately, I don't think that this argument is key to Obama's political fate. I don't think health care is that important. Uh, Whoa. Ultimately, Whoa. I oh. think that he, he uh, <laughs> bit off a Got lot very early in the administration, and people are worried more now about I, the economy. I don't want you to think that I wasn't paying attention to you before, but now I'm really <laughs> paying attention to you. I, well, how can you say that health care reform and, and any push against it is not key for President Obama in re-election? I think that people are going to vote for or against Obama based primarily on the economy. I think that the issues surrounding health care are so abstract that people are not going to be able to grasp them and they're going to focus on but, the result of the case, the not the real fast. All right, Doug, I want to get you Just in the here. sound bite, though, in the campaign is going to be, you know, Romney care was the same thing, you know. Right, and, and for sure, the <laughs> Obama's passage of the Health Care Act is one of the, you know, the most substantial legislative accomplishments uh, of this administration. So, of course, this is going to be catnip for the GOPs and they're going to try to, you know, tear at it and, and, and destroy his All most right. uh, most successful accomplishment. I, I do think they're talking out of both sides of their mouths, though, because if you look at their budget plans, they have uh, Medicare being going into private insurance plans, and seniors are going to have to pay into that. So I think it's almost yeah. um, hypocritical on, on some level. Uh, I don't think they are philosophically opposed to this. I think they're politically opposed, and I think that when you see that budget plan, where it's privatizing Medicare, in a sense, and letting Medicare, as we know it, wither on the vine, there's, there's a hypo hypocrisy there, for sure. Uh, Joy EEB writes on the live chat, I think all states will have to step in and sue if they really want to see the law change. Well, they, yeah, I mean, one of the really biggest legal questions, and I'm glad that this was raised right there. I know, I'm going to say thank you to yeah, you Joy should, EB. Because it is all about, you know, in constitutional law, state governments versus the federal government. Where, when should states be able to legislate and implement their own programs versus when is it truly a federal issue? Working back to Mark's point with Bush v. Gore, I mean, the federal government had no business getting involved in something that was strictly a Florida election matter. Mm -hmm. So the, it's the same argument here. I mean, it's, it's almost bound to be a partisan five to four ideologically based decisions with the liberal wing of the court. Um, supporting federal intervention and the conservative block, the states rights block has been very vigilant in enforcing the 10th amendment and they're almost certain to strike uh, it all down. Right. And uh, Justice all of, Kennedy all for jury, it. who I suspect might be an attorney on our live chat, I don't know. Oh, good. I believe it's a dead issue. I suspect the Supreme Court will down the law. They might believe the state's right argument, but they will ultimately uphold its ninth amendment right now, not a 10th amendment mandate. Well, uh, I mean, whether they're going to wade into the Tenth Amendment uh, uh, or not is an open question, but there have been two major, major Tenth Amendment yeah. decisions out of the court in the past t um, 10 years, and I don't expect them to pass on the Tenth Amendment at all. I don't know why they would have taken the case if not for political reasons, if they weren't right. going to get into the well, so yeah. well, Hold on one second. And, one, political reasons, what does the Supreme Court gain at this point? I have no idea why they, they took the case. And I think it's a black eye for them no matter what they do. I wanted to make a point, which is right off of your question, Harris, and that is there's so much hypocrisy, because think about Bush v. Gore, where the argument from the right was, don't get involved in this, and then think of the Terry Schiavo case, where they wanted to take her off oh, life support, and now all of a sudden the same exact people are jumping right. into that case. Mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, before I have to let you go, because I really want to get to this, and, and they're going to keep me in my ear honest on time, uh, there's a case that's going on. You talk about wading yeah. into different issues. Sure. Uh, there's a 14-year-old, a, a case rather, uh, Miller versus Alabama, that says a 14-year-old uh, can be sentenced to life without parole if the case involves murder. That's the issue before yes. the Supreme Court. Now, before this, in 2010, uh, the court ruled that criminals under 18 cannot be sentenced to life without parole, but those cases did not involve murder. That is a key point and difference in all of this. Where do you see us going now? Well, Mark and I were discussing this before we came on the air with you. I mean, the point is, this is a continuing line of cases. And Mark will explain it better than I. And it started with, you know, can a mentally retarded defendant be put to death? Can a juvenile be put to death? Now, can you give life without parole to a juvenile? And they said, 
they answered that question, but not in a case with death. So now the issue is whether you can do it with someone the, the where real, a murder resulted. The real problem with the law is that uh, life without parole is a mandatory penalty. It doesn't let the sentencer uh, give the defendant a break for his youthful age or the fact that he wasn't actually the trigger man and one of these defendants right. was not the actual killer mm -hmm. and he was mm -hmm. just an accomplice in what they call a felony murder. And that's the real problem with the law and having read the transcripts from the oral argument, that's the problem that the justices have with it. Uh, the fact that, these, uh, that the sentence is mandatory and gives the sentencer no discretion uh, to give the Could youthful they just offender statutorily a carve out that it has to be the actual shooter. Uh, the, the statutes in Alabama and especially at Arkansas, in Arkansas, the one at issue in this case, uh, allow death for felony murders. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I want to give everybody. Uh, Mark Furnish is a criminal and civil litigator based in Manhattan. You've argued before the U.S. Supreme Court, and also you lecture at Brooklyn Law School. Mm -hmm. uh, f former federal prosecutor. You guys see things slightly differently just in terms of how you approach the bench. I'm curious, how different inside of the Supreme Court is like a regular courtroom when you take an issue like, you know, life without parole for a 14-year-old? <laughs> well, it's funny. I mean, real quick, yesterday I was in the Court of Appeals, downtown Manhattan. That's the intermediate rung. Uh, Mark actually argued in the U.S. Supreme Court. My father argued there twice, which was very exciting. I only got to go to one because I was in a trial the other time. But, I mean, it's an incredibly imposing, mm -hmm. amazing venue. The Marble Palace, the big columns, the red velvet. Um, but, again, it's, it really... Sounds like Prince's House. Some, some, <laughs> some, some, it's like <laughs> Sorry. And, I haven't been in Prince's House. I, I've only seen Prince's House. And <laughs> you're arguing in front of nine jurists, which is uh, not the case in any other court. Well, once I argued before the full Second Circuit, which is oh, a federal uh, appeals yeah. court in Manhattan, and then there's 15 of them, yeah. and that was harder. In the Supreme Court, you're very well prepared. You've had lots of practice. You're up really close, as mm -hmm. close as I am to you guys now. The only thing is they're sitting high above you, so that's yeah. a little bit impossible. Now, what about this, this comment uh, from the live chat? No child should be sent to an adult prison until they're 21. Well, that's the, the theoretical underpinning of the whole juvenile distinction is that you know, you carve out a different set of, you know, penological aims, goals, and procedures for those who are that young. I mean, that's simply the statement, as it were, of the rationale of why you wouldn't punish a juvenile. Yeah. I mean, if you remember the Skakel case, not to jump all over the place, that case was fascinating because Michael Skakel was a juvenile when the crime happened, and I've never understood to this day why he was punished as an adult. Well, the rationale behind the earlier <coughs> opinions is that children as a group are immature, right. they're impulsive, and they have spotty judgment. So it's right. not appropriate to uh, punish them with the stiffest sentences available under law. So to that extent, um, yeah. the uh, viewer has, has a point. Yeah. I, I hear what you're saying, unless it's your family member. Well, and then suddenly, no, no, right. yeah. so but suddenly I mean, it's, it's different. Hey, uh, you know, record, interestingly, some of the victims submitted friend of the court briefs in this case uh -huh. against yeah, that's life a good without point. Uh, yeah. that's, that's an excellent good, yeah. point to make. That's okay, when do we see this going forward? <coughs> At the end of June. At be the end of June. Point. Okay. Uh, all for jury says, just FYI, I'm not an attorney. Well, ah. you, you now play one on TV. That's all there is well, to it. Well, she would have gone down in our estimation if she had been one. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> no, she, she would have. I hold her in higher esteem. Oh, because, how sweet is that? Well, because joking aside, I think you would agree with this. A lot of times, uh, untrained people come up with the key common sense points. Uh, Very often. The law is yeah. supposed to be based on common sense, yeah. and too often it's a perversion of common yeah. sense. Wow. Okay. Mark Furnish and Doug Burns, you guys are terrific together. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You should do Appreciate a panel that. on a show. Let's. Again, this one, real soon. I'm ready. Anytime Will you come you say back? Okay. Are you kidding? Of course. Thank you.